Mayor Green. Paul, would you open it up for us, sir? And Mayor Green. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we just come to you and thank you and praise you for this opportunity to meet, to uh, be blessed by what you have uh, portrayed to Jack, to portray to us, and just open our eyes and open our, our spiritual eyes, our spiritual heart, to let us hear the truths that you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm going to start in chapter 10 of Matthew, uh, and I'm probably just going to go through this one chapter. But in front of you, you should have a sheet, a paper that uh, is kind of sad that they have to read this. But and if you look at this, this is a this is taking the pulse of the country, and some of the is pointing back to the, to the Bible teachers or the seminaries that are teaching, uh, educating pastors. And what is kind of sad is if you read down this list, I may not read everything, but uh, almost 70% of churchgoers believe for some reason everyone's going to go to heaven. I don't know where they get that. Almost 60% of millennials believe pornography is morally acceptable. 70% of those attending church once or more times a month have never shared their faith, ever. Uh, one in four are not certain of the physical resurrection of Christ. So one in four evangelicals are not 100% certain that Christ rose from the dead. That's troubling. Half of churchgoers say they've never heard the Great Commission, never heard of it. Uh, 70% of unchurched people have never even been invited to ask. That's why I invited Robin, and, you know, I invited... She's probably been asked before, but I don't know that. But So it, this is really sad. 46% uh, of evangelicals agree that God accepts the worship of all religions. These are, these are professing Christians that are saying this, that are living next door to you and me and... People that may not go to church, but they believe in God, and yes, I'm a Christian. And they think they can go into a garage, and, and I'm a car. Because they're in church, they think they're Christian. That's not enough. So 65% of Christians believe there are multiple paths to heaven. That's two out of every three believers think there's other ways. A third of Americans believe that after they die, God will give them a second chance. Even though Hebrews 9.27 says, after death, it comes to judgment. And half of those in church last Sunday cannot remember a single thing from the sermon. So if you don't remember anything, remember this sheet, okay? If you, that's sad. I mean, that's why we take notes. Some people take notes. And over half of those attending church at least once a month have not had a born-again experience. In other words, what this is telling me, over half or more of the church is full of terrors. That's, that's shocking, but it needs to be said. And, and it, it matches up with what Jesus says. Many are called, few are chosen. Uh, so, and I go to Matthew 10. This is kind of where Jesus releases the 12 disciples. He called to them, Matthew 10, verse 1, his 12 disciples, and he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. We had a man try to a failed attempt at uh, getting rid of a demon in Larned, and he had been end up cutting himself. So it's kind of like if you don't know what you're doing and, and you, this is all you want to do, you don't care about a relationship, you just want to go out and cast out demons. This is this is going to lead to trouble because his heart was not in the right place. The names of the twelve apostles are these: verse two, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, those are the sons of thunder, okay? These guys were uh, anything but converted. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican or the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, uh, Labacius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanite, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So these 12, Jesus sent out, sent forth and commissioned them, saying, go into the way of the Gentiles, and into the city, or do not go into the way of the Gentiles, but into the city of the Samaritans, do not enter. 
but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul said salvation is of the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. So he wanted to focus on the fact that he's going to share the gospel with the Jewish people first. As you go, preach saying the kingdom of God is at hand. One thing about that, they went out in pairs. Who got stuck with Judas Iscariot? You know, they didn't know that he was uh, a betrayer yet, but I'm not sure how effective he would have been if he had power over unclean spirits because the, obviously the man was not converted. But they went in preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. They said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. This shows that miracles of God do not come from man. It is only from God. We saw that earlier that Jesus in this chapter, that he gave them power in verse 1. He gave them power. We got no power on our own. That's understood, I hope. Now, next, verse 9. Don't provide gold, nor silver, nor, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, nor shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his uh, meal. What a stave is, is a seasoned hard wood. It's got it's kind of shot in iron. It's kind of like a, got a spike at the end. It's a, it's a defensive weapon. That, that's what that is. I looked at the word stave, so it's kind of a defensive weapon in a sense. Uh, that I did not realize it's got a spike at the end of it. So they're, he's wanting them to trust God, completely trust God. It would be like me going to Lorna. I got no gas. I got no food. But Jesus says, go. Don't worry about it but bring a cell phone in case you get in trouble, like the state. So in other words, uh, he's wanting them to totally depend upon God. And into whatever city or town you enter, inquire uh, who in it is worthy. That is, who are those who have believed in perhaps God? Thereby, you shall stay until you go. The, ver the part in verse 11 is saying, stay at the same place where you are shown hospitality. I think what he's saying is, if you go to a town and someone invites you in and to offer you to stay there, and stay in the first place because that was a God-ordained thing. Don't go, well, these guys are from God. This guy's got a nicer house. Why don't you stay with us? You don't have to stay in this little place. i got a better location. The way I've heard it explained by Dr. McGee, and I agree with him, is stay where you're put. Don't look for a better deal. Trust God in the sovereignty. Uh, so I think that's why he's saying stay there until you're ready to go. Okay. And when you come into a house, salute it or greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, verse 13. But if not, if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whatever, wherever you, whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or the city, shall shake the dust off of your feet. That is as a witness against them, evidence that you've been there, you've had the gospel. That is physical evidence that you've brought the gospel to that community. Most assuredly, I say to you, it will, be no, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why? Because they knew less about God. They, they knew less of Christ. Uh, they had heard fewer prophets. At that time, there were not a lot of prophets going into Sodom and Gomorrah. They had the angels that came literally had to yank Sodom and his family out because they did not want to leave. So it's going to be more tolerable for them because they've got a greater witness, Christ, in front of them. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The words harmless means just, just be simple. Uh, don't, don't try to make it complicated. The word harmless doesn't mean a dove is not going to hurt anybody anyway. You know, but the point is be gentle, uh, loving, uh, and kind, but be cunning like a snake in the sense of using your intelligence. And, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up. Now here he's speaking, he's speaking specifically, remember, he sent out the, the 12 apostles, he's talking to them, and this stuff will come true in their lifetime. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the council. The first time that happened was uh, Stephen... King and uh, Acts 8, and then later uh, you will hear 
Peter and Silas, actually before Acts 8, so they were, this was fulfilled in the book of Acts, they will scourge you in the synagogues. He's, taking, he's speaking to the disciples, okay? We can't look at this and think this is going to be to us. I'm going to be delivered to the council and I'm going to be scourged. This is specifically he said to them, okay? And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Okay, that's why it's, the context is toward them and it's not necessarily for us because... I've never met the governor. I bet they've never returned my call before. They will not will be willing to speak with me, but they will, these men, because they are bringing a gospel. And Jesus said, all who live godly will be persecuted. They knew this was coming. You'll be brought before the governor, but you're going to be doing this for a testimony, verse 16, 18, against them and the Gentiles. In other words, you're bringing testimony against them about judgment and sin and the wrath of God, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you will speak for what shall be given to you in that same hour that you will speak. I believe that speaking about the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say at the time. So in other words, they're not supposed to rehearse. You imagine them trying, they know they're going to be in court the next day, and they may not have a pen and paper, but they says, okay, we need to do this, and I need to say this, and then no depend upon God. I think they, they're being told not to worry about it because the Spirit will prompt them to speak in that same hour. Verse 20, Matthew 10. For it is not you that speaks, but the, the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. And now here it's, it's going to get worse, and it did get worse. In, in Jerusalem 68 to 70 AD, there were more people betrayed by their family members uh, than in the first 30 years after Christ had ascended because the brother delivered up brother to death, the father, the children, and the children rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. In verse 22, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. You know, you will be hated. Stephen, in, in the book of Acts 8, chapter 8, you can see how they hated Stephen. They grind their teeth at him. He gave them the testimony. He showed them evidence out of the Bible and proof that Christ was the Messiah. And what did they do? They, they hated him. And they stoned him. When they persecute you in this city, flee to the other. Verse 23. For assuredly I say to you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. That means cut, go over. You have, would have not have finished going over all of the cities by this time. One thing about I, I want to point out is that when they persecute you in the city, flee into another. Undoubtedly, persecution spread the church quicker than anything else. Imagine a one, somebody trying to put out a grass fire. And what you do is you spread it. And you're trying to stomp out Christianity. And what they do is spread witnesses out to take the gospel all over the place. I told you about in China, they had you know, 30 or 50 men that they were Christians. They, they rounded them up. And they spread, sent them all different parts of China where they couldn't have any contact with each other. And inadvertently, the Chinese spread the gospel throughout the whole continent by trying to destroy a small remnant. They spread the gospel throughout China, although it is a very small church and it is underground, and China has only one official church and it doesn't talk about Christ. Remember, the disciple is not above his master, verse 24, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough, verse 25, for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. Now, if they've called the master of the house, in other words, they've called Jesus Christ Beelzebub. How much more shall they call them of his household? In other words, if they're calling you Satan, Jesus Satan, then what are they going to call us? His little demons. I mean, we're associated in with that group. I want to explain just a bit about Beelzebub. That, that, the Hebrews had a, that's the name of a Philistine god. The <coughs> Hebrews had Beelzebub is a Philistine god associated with the Canaanite pagan god of Baal. You heard of Baal? Baal was the religion that Israel finally fell into and got taken captive. Judah, the southern kingdom, did not fall into that. 
Baal actually offered children sacrifices in a statue. And it looked like a big giant Buddha, big fat guy, and he's got his hands out here. And there's fire, and they would place infants in the fire, live infants, as an offering. That's how far, if you look at First and Second Kings, that's how far Israel fell into idolatry, where they were sacrificing their own children. In fact, some of the kings of Israel sacrificed, one of them sacrificed two of his own sons, a king of Israel. So the associated name of this, calling Jesus this, is amazing. For that fear them not, Jesus is telling them, for there's nothing that's covered that shall not be revealed, and nothing hid that shall not be known. What I'm telling you now in the darkness, that I want you to speak in the light, verse 27. And what you hear in the ear, that preach in the housetops. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Verse 28, Matthew 10, but rather... Fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. If you've seen the, if you read the parable of the Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus is in torment. He has a memory. He has his senses because he's thirsty. He's warm. So all of these things uh, are going to be non-existent even after you are cast into hell. And so he's, he's trying to warn them. This is the motivation to save people, but not to worry about those who kill you. The greatest thing is to worry about is falling into the hands of an angry God. But Jesus reassures them now after kind of warning them, verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father's knowledge? In other words, a sparrow was one of the smallest birds that you could give as an offering. It was one of the poorest. In fact, some even had to split. Families came in to split the poorest an offering of one sparrow. He uses a sparrow because they're the insignificant, smallest of the kingdom. Basically, they're, they're everywhere. Sparrows are never in short supply, uh, more, more than a dime a dozen. And even a sparrow, the father cares for a little tiny sparrow, showing that he does care for his creatures out there and the way we treat them. So he's making a point here. One of them doesn't fall to the ground without the father's knowledge. Verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, understand, for most of the men, it's getting easier to do the math. But that's the intimate knowledge that he has of us, every single hair. It's not the fact that he knows every uh, fact about how many hairs we have in here. And he probably changed the count every day. But the fact that it has intimate knowledge to something so tiny that we think it's insignificant, but not to God. Okay, a tiny hair and a fall sparrow, if it's to do to us, is not insignificant. If a child scrapes and falls his knee, most people say, well, it's a child, and he's a child's kind of thing. But to the parent or the grandparent, it's highly significant because they were going to run to mom and, uh, and run to dad, whoever's closest. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. The word many is unnumbered. Okay, if you take all the sparrows in the world and put them over here, and you're over here on this scale, the scale's still going to go this way in your favor. Okay, he's saying that look at the world. He cares for the world, but take all the sparrows in the world, and you're worth more than that to me. That's a tender, loving thing of Christ to, to say. Amen. Let's wrap chapter 10 up in Matthew 10, verse 32. Now he's still speaking to the apostles, but I believe here this is applying to us. Whoever therefore shall confess, whosoever, if, what are you saying? Well, you could say, because of what I just told you, whoever is going to confess me, because he's speaking in the context of witnessing, okay? So he's saying, any of you that out there with that confess me, Christ, before men, him I will confess also before my Father which is in heaven. The word confess, if you, if you fess up to something, I did it. You know, you've heard that, I fess up. Con is with. So here we confess, we agree with the knowledge that Christ is the Lord. 
we're confessing this to men. It doesn't say uh, that we confess them to some men or and we leave out women or we leave out children. The general, it's a generic term in the non-masculine form of mankind. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him I will also deny before my Father which is in heaven. You know, how you could deny him? By your silence. Uh, a lot of people, we already read about this, you know, they haven't even heard of the Great Commission. Uh, it is for them the great omission. You know, we'll be judged according to our sins of commission and our sins of omission, and that's a big one. Uh, we have the words of life, yet we won't share it with the person next door. Our, our cousins are probably, our family are most difficult uh, to share that with, but if we're going to deny men by our silence, uh, then it's showing that we may have not, we're ashamed of our uh, Christ to know him, and we're ashamed to speak out for him. Verse 34, think not that I come to descend peace on earth. You know, the very first part when Christ came to send peace on earth and goodwill toward men, mm -hmm. it says goodwill toward those who God favors. That, that, trend, that, that makes a nice greeting card, a Christmas card, but it's not accurate. It is toward those who are uh, called uh, by God and loved by God. He's not come to bring peace. You go out and share the gospel of peace and joy and love, I bet you don't get peace back. You get anger and wrath, and people do not like to hear, uh, have their conscience pricked uh, by uh, judgment and sin and things like that. I came not to send peace, but a sword, and of course part of the sword <coughs> is the Word of God. And this Word of God, is, it divides and it cuts and it divides families, it divides friends, it divides a, a fam just divides nations. For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Verse 36, and a man's foe shall be the of his own household. This may have to remember though, the households, the families lived together. There were no uh, nursing homes or assisted care homes. So these homes included aunts and uncles, grandparents, you know, there may have been several. Uh, we don't know exactly how many, but the, the idea here is just not one, the immediate family. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It makes you think of Abraham testing, being tested by God, and if is he going to offer up his son Isaac, does he have higher love for Isaac or a higher love for obedience toward God? I'm not sure that he was testing him, but it looks a little, it could be possible that he had, this was the son of promise. This was the only son that he would have. And so not counting the son of promise, I don't mean the other son uh, through his other wife, but He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If Abraham had refused, I'm not sure what would have happened. Abraham obeyed God, though, and he obviously obeyed his obedience and love for God superseded that of his own son. Same thing for the father. He had actually didn't supersede it, but the father had the same love for his son, but he was willing to let him die for showing his great love for us. Let's wrap this chapter up. And he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. Your cross is not your arthritis, you're not bursitis, you're not your diabetes, you're not your gout, you're not your broken bones, you're not your uh, busted hip. Your cross, here in the context, is persecution. The cross is suffering for Christ by sharing the gospel. The cross is not our personal, I can't live with my, my father-in-law, I just can't stand him anymore, or my, you know, just fill in the blank. This is to do with Christ and the gospel. You bear your cross and follow me. But if you don't, you're not worthy of him. He that finds his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. We talked about that as a little bit of Bible study. That uh, we're pretty well, you know, we're, we are dead in our sins. And if we lose the life we want, this life, and focus on this life, we're going to lose eternal life. But if we focus on the life to come, or Christ, and eternal life, we shall find it. So, ironically, by dying to yourself, you receive eternal life. 
by trying to hang on to your life, you lose your life in Christ. Last few verses, he, Matthew 10, for he that receives me, I beg your pardon, he that receives you receives me, and he that receives me receives him that sent me. See how that's a chain. Okay. I share, I've shared the gospel with uh, someone in Lord, and, I'm, and I feel embarrassed, but I can't think of his last name. I can remember Mark's only thing. He rejected it. But I got the message from Christ in the gospel, so he didn't really reject me. He rejected Christ in the gospel that, that I learned here. And then he not only rejected Christ and the gospel, he rejected the Father who sent Christ. So see, it goes all the way back to God. They're not rejecting us. They're rejecting Christ. And it's not really us they hate. It's not the messenger, but the message. Okay, uh, That doesn't mean they won't treat us with contempt. Last two verses. Matthew 10. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And now, so whoever shall give drink to one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, most assuredly I say to you, he will in no way lose his reward. The one man that was openly hostile and atheist that I met seven, eight years, maybe nine years ago in a trailer, who invited me in for the cold glass of water. I remember I told you I was witnessing. It was a hot day, 100 degrees. He invited me in. He gave me a cold glass of water. And I quoted this verse. I never, never seen him again. I'm tempted to go by there if you remember me. But this reminded me of him. And maybe I put a little bit of think in his conscience that that you are helping someone. I'm not claiming to be a disciple necessarily, but I'm sharing the gospel, and he felt sorry for me. I think, you know what, according to this, you will not lose your reward. And I think that may mean that after he comes to Christ. So, bearing the cross is serving others, enduring persecution, and sharing the gospel, and even being called a little demon. I've heard Jesus called that you're a sky daddy and his little son, and I won't even repeat the name, insulting uh, him, but it's not really him or me or you they insult, it's Christ they hate, and so don't take it personal when you hand a Bible track or you say something to someone and they put it back in your face, thing. all you can do is share the gospel, and it's not your responsibility to save them, it is their response to God's ability, even though it is our responsibility to share. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for the opportunity to preach the gospel wherever we go and having the freedom and, uh, to, to worship in the open and to share the gospel without fear of punishment in jail. <coughs> Many today are in jail. It, imprisoned and tortured and lost their lives simply for sharing the gospel if they have not denied Christ. They bear their cross every day. Many of us here, we have no idea of the cross that they bear and we have nothing to compare it with in this life. We pray for them that they endure to the end. We pray for those who are not here today that they might return next week. And we ask your blessing upon those who are there today and also for our service this afternoon at the nursing home that we bring you glory O oh lord and that's all that matters to you is the glory none to us but to you O oh lord we pray in jesus holy name amen, amen. amen.